And with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator, or our opening speaker for tonight, Rick Thompson. He is one of the co-founders of Green Tech Media, and he is going to be talking about our special series for this year for the Grid Edge. So welcome, Rick. Uh, I'm going to lose this thing here. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, there we go. All I heard was ACDC playing at the Urban Future Lab. That sounds cool. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I did one of these before these events, and like right about now, um, since we're live streaming, and I got a, a, a text, and it was my mother like saying I wasn't on the live stream yet or whatever. So, if my mom's out there, hi. Um, <laughs> But um, Grid Edge is, is actually a term that we had coined uh, last year at Green Tech Media and GTM Research. So before we get into the panel, which we'll get into a lot of the details around the growth of PV and what has to happen in terms of the grid, um, there, I think it needs a little bit of explaining about what the Grid Edge, grid edge is. So that's essentially what I'm going to spend a few minutes trying to do. Um, but before I do, I just want to again thank Solar One and thank NYC Acre for having us. And, um, yeah, just remind everyone in the room that we are actually live streaming this over greentechmedia.com, so we have a, a bit of a broader audience out there. So next slide, please. Um, so just really quickly, uh, to talk about this series, we've been working with um, these two organizations for a number of years and doing these uh, events. And when Micah and I met late last year, I suggested that um, we try to come up with a theme for all of the events throughout the year, um, which we had, hadn't really done before in the past. And that theme turned out to be Grid Edge. Um, and I'll explain what that is uh, as I go through the introduction. But just quickly uh, th to mention what events will be happening later in the year. Tonight, I think, will be very interesting because when I, when I get into what Grid Edge is, um, I think the, what you'll see is that it's very... There are different stakeholders from all different parts of the industry. So you're going to have power utilities, you're going to have startup vendors, you're going to have um, financiers uh, and um, kind of th new third party types of service providers. And I think we have a good mix of all those on the panel tonight with Con Ed, Gridco System, a startup from Boston, um, Solar City, and um, Sunlight General Capital. So it's a nice cross section of, of panelists to co cover this in great detail. And um, GTM Research will be moderating it, and I'll introduce Ben uh, in just a minute to, to kick that off. But in May, um, <clears throat> you can kind of see the, the exact titles in your program, but we're going to be talking about intelligent storage. So one of the things that is um, paramount to grow PV is to you know, have a pro proliferation of energy storage out there. And that has traditionally been a very big challenge for the industry because of cost and technology availability and, and a number of things. So we're starting to see that rapidly advance and we're starting to see policy, especially in places like California, um, uh, you know, enable the deployment of those technologies. But beyond kind of the material science and the chemistry of uh, storage and battery technology, which has predominantly been what's been driving up the cost and complexity of these products, we're starting to see a whole other host of um, interesting companies that are working out kind of coordination software for distributed storage systems. So that'll largely be what the second event's about. The third one looks at you know, intelligent buildings and building management systems that are connected to a, to a smart grid. And the final one looks at really kind of the software layer of, of, of the grid edge. And I'll go through the different layers. Um, and, and talks about how important the data is that's being collected from whether it's a PV system, whether it's a home energy management system, et cetera, et cetera, um, and how software and analytics are going to be applied into the energy world, much like they're being applied into you know, the internet world, um, the Facebooks, the Amazon.coms of the world, use analytics to you know, sell you products. All these types of analytic technologies are now being applied to energy. So we're going to try to cover a nice cross-section of those things. Um, so. So the grid edge, just at a very high level, and I'll kind of explain it in more detail, is if you, if you were to say tomorrow, um, everyone in the United States is going to have um, you know, solar on their rooftops. Everyone will be like, all right, that sounds great, yeah, awesome. And then, but the reality is, the, if that actually happened, it would, be it would be fundamentally problematic for the electric grid and um, the generation of that power. There would be a lot of issues, and that's technically what, at its core, the grid edge is looking at. It's marrying the grid infrastructure technology and the, and the evolution that's happening there with what's happening kind of at the home or, or the business in terms of distributed generation, energy management, and even new load types like electric vehicles. So the load, piles are very, load profiles are very different, and um, you're starting to move generation out to the edge. So when you start to marry these two things together, um, that's kind of the whole thesis of Grid Edge, and I'll explain a little more technically what it is. But there are really five main <clears throat> drivers for, for what's, uh, you know, I guess, causing this 
You could call it um, a pain point for utilities. You could call it an opportunity for them. You can call it an opportunity for the market and for vendors. But the first is distributed generation and decentralization. So as you know, when you put PV on a rooftop, you're um, moving the generation from a central generator, uh, which is likely a coal-fired power plant, to you know, solar on someone's roof. If you do that on millions of homes across the country, um, you're starting to literally distribute the generation that was um, previously very centralized um, and, and this is all that, not all that different from other types of decentralization and distribution technologies and shifts that have occurred in computing when you went from mainframe computing to desktop computing to laptops and now mobile computing. It's a very similar type of thing when you, when you change that fundamental point of where something, whether it's computing, whether it's energy generation occurs, everything in the middle um, you have to relook at how it's architected, how it's built, and how it's connected. And that's essentially um, a core to most of how this grid edge will evolve. Intermittency and unpredictability, I think, is, is a big issue. So clearly today, um, with traditional energy generation, it's very predictable. Um, it's, it's not intermittent at all. So you, know, you can rest assured that when you go home and you turn the lights on, it's going to work, and et cetera, et cetera, um, in, in, in you know, most cases. Now, when you start to... Um, put a high penetration of renewables out there, you start to run into intermittency issues and unpredictability issues. And so controlling that and communicating those issues via you know, software and hardware technologies, either back to the utility or, or back to you know, some third-party energy provider is going to be key in, in enabling uh, and solving that problem so that you can you know, essentially deploy these technologies at scale. Um, so we talk, we'll talk a lot about PV tonight in the panel, and solar PV is really you know, one of the main drivers of grid edge, but it also, also kind of depends on what state you're in. If you're in California and you have a lot of PV being deployed, it's the number one um, solar deployment in the United States, um, that's maybe a main driver for you. If you're in the Northeast, for example, last year's um, you know, Superstorm Sandy, you know, resiliency and um, reliability is a major factor, and I think that when you start to create a distributed system, you, you know, some, people, some of the utilities are a little bit concerned because they're like, oh, well, what happens to our reliability that we're so used to? But inherently, a distributed system is much more reliable. Just take another example, let's take a look at the internet. It's highly distributed. Um, you don't have widespread internet outages where like entire you know, cities are out you know, for an entire you know, days or, or, or weeks or et cetera like we had in, in uh, New York City last year. And so once you start to distribute these assets and control them between one another, you create a much more resilient infrastructure in the event of major catastrophic you know, uh, storms that are you know, essentially um, <clears throat> you know, like predicted to increase based on you know, climate change. Um, the fourth one being the availability of energy-centric IT, and I think this is fundamentally uh, another thing that's not necessarily new, it's just new to this market. So if you look at all the technologies that went into building the internet, all the technologies that went into building um, you know, telecom networks, um, many of those things, whether it be networking protocols, whether it be data analytics software, um, they're now being adapted <clears throat> to energy-specific applications, and there are a ton of companies out there that are developing these and have, will have opportunity in this, in this world going forward. And then finally is the, you know, the transformation of the traditional utility business model. And this is probably one of the biggest challenges because it's, um, <clears throat> it's not something that, you know, technology is, gonna, is, is there largely today and will continue to be there um, over the course of the next few years. But to change the way an entire industry has done business for 100 years and then uh, en enable policy uh, to let them you know, make these changes, that's much more of a, you know, essentially a political issue or you know, a business issue in terms of how, how do they you know, recover costs, how do they, re how do they reward their investors, those kinds of things. So that transformation is happening, you know, whether utilities like it or not. Um, based on the sheer fact that, that solar is growing and um, it's going to continue to grow. So um, with that said, a couple uh, intro slides about solar. Uh, it's really not a question of, of uh, if, but when. And uh, if any of you kind of tuned into um, Barack Obama's uh, State of the Union address in January, 
one of the things that he mentioned was every four minutes another American home or business goes solar. That data point actually came from GTM research and we're forecasting in 2016 that it's gonna be about roughly a new solar deployment every 80 seconds or so. So it's definitely not a question of if, it's just a question of when and how much. Uh, and these are some numbers I had to actually earlier in the day, you'll see on the, the little black boxes on the left there are, are blacked out. We, um, are actually announcing these numbers later tonight, so we're under embargo with various press outlets. But I can share a little bit of that with you, and then tomorrow on our website, some of the details will be available. But um, in, in 2013, the solar market in the United States grew over 35%, with over 4.5 gigawatts deployed. Um, and if you take a look at that number, that amount of... Um, deployment just in 2013 alone is greater than all solar deployments in the 30 years prior to that. So we're clearly at the beginning of what I, I would call a hockey stick curve and we're forecasting, you know, next year, you know, cumulative 18 gigawatts and that'll put the United States, I believe, in third um, place essentially with total gigawatts deployed uh, in, in the year 2014, China being number one, Japan being number two. Uh, so now just a couple quick slides on the grid edge itself uh, to explain it a little bit more and then I'll introduce the panel. There's really this next, I'm going to present this simple version of the slide first and then the next slide kind of blows this out in more detail. So you can see there's kind of a, a cube there that has uh, three sides showing. One side is essentially the, uh, the utility electric grid. So there's a lot of things, you may have heard the word smart grid or you know other types of terminology. Um, that whole face of the cube is really about grid modernization and all the technologies that go into um, <clears throat> uh, enabling that. And then on the other side of the cube, it would, I would call customer evolution. So this is everything happening behind the customer's meter, whether it's a residential consumer or a commercial industrial consumer. You might have PV being deployed, you might have EV be, EVs being purchased in you know, pockets of, of various demographics. You have energy management systems being put into place. You saw Nest recently was acquired by Google for you know, three point odd million, or billion dollars. Um, they're doing home energy management systems and smart home technologies. Um, so you've got a lot of things happening both on the utility side of the meter and the customer side of the meter. Um, that are now finally starting to come together and form this grid edge stack, as we like to call it. And then on the top, you can, you can, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, that one's good. Um, on the top layer is really about business model transformation. So it's basically looking at the different layers, what's happening with the technology, and um, stating that there are going to be new types of opportunities for utilities to evolve, new players are going to enter the market. Solar Cities here tonight, you know, they're um, obviously you know, viewed in some ways, maybe a threat to utilities. Utilities are, you know, potentially looking at, you know, working with them and, and, and embracing, you know, folks like that. So how all these entities will end up working together, you know, down the road is a little bit unclear. And that, um, that market confusion is really, you know, embodied in this, in this diagram here, which is very detailed, and I don't expect you to be able to read it all. But essentially, we made this last year when we came up with the concept of Grid Edge. Um, and we have a whole market research practice where we do in-depth research on each of these, you know, little boxes, et cetera. But this is essentially modeled after um, the seven-layer OSI stack um, that the internet is fundamentally built on. So you have a physical layer, and you go all the way up to the top, and you have an application layer. It's not all that dissimilar here. You have a physical layer of the grid. On the grid side, you have, you know, look out the window. You've got power transformers. You've got electric poles and lines, and those go back to substations, and in between you've got reclosers, all this crazy hardware, right? Um, and on the customer side, you're starting to see the physical layer there being distributed PV, you know, uh, more advanced customers with maybe distributed storage. There are other types of generation, could be fuel cells, could be CHP. We've, we tend to focus a little bit uh, more on PV just because that's the, the main driver for distributed generation. And then if you go up, you have kind of a network and control layer. So you have these physical assets at the bottom, and then above that, you have a networking layer that's not dissimilar at all from telecom networks. They're using IP protocols, just adapted for specific types of assets they need to connect and talk to. You may have heard the term Internet of Things. This is, this is squarely in the space of Internet of Things. Um, and this is really the control protocols and the languages that enable these devices to talk to one another. And then above that, you have the application layer. So now that you have all this technology in place, 
okay, well, what can you do with it? If you're a utility, you can have some you know, interesting load forecasting um, technologies and systems. You can do advanced metering. Um, you know, the, the list goes on and on. And if you're a consumer, you might have a you know, more tight, tightly controlled you know, home energy management system that you can um, you know, set to you know, either price signals or you know, other types of things that are driving you as a consumer. Um, and then above all of that, you have this analytics layer. So um, I don't know if any of you, probably many of you in the room are familiar with Opower. They just announced this week that they filed their S1 for an IPO. We covered it, I think, yesterday. Opower has done a great job of consumer analytics and give, letting the utilities understand exactly how um, different demographics of utilities are consuming power. And that's only going to get more and more complex. So today, it's pretty basic. It's you know, a smart meter, and it's kind of aggregate consumption. But when you start to put batteries, electric vehicles, solar panels, inverters that are connected to solar panels, all these things are going to have communications interfaces, smart appliances, so that you can not just have an aggregate load, but a very detailed load per device to understand where you can do some energy savings. The, the amount of analytics on the consumer side is just going to continue to grow, uh, and people are going to benefit uh, from the services that are enabled by the, the, by the availability of that data. And similarly, on the utility side, they've got a ton of connected assets. Um, you know, they might have a transformer in Berkeley that has an electric vehicle attached to it today, and in six months, it might have four electric vehicles attached to it. And they can predict failures of those types of devices much more quickly if they can see load types like that coming onto the system versus just waiting for it to fail, having an outage, and having customers call in and, and be pissed off because they don't have power. So there's a ton of benefits. And the bottom line is it's very, very similar to how the internet architecture has evolved and, quite frankly, um, using technologies you know, from that world. So with that, um, hopefully that kind of explains you know, what the grid edge is in some sense. And I'm going to introduce Ben Kellison. He's a senior analyst with GTM Research to kick off the panel. Uh, we've got some great speakers, so thanks very much.